استشهاد على حواجز قتل حتى للصحفيين اللي بقوا للحقائق المعرضين الغازات السامة اللي بيستخدموها مياه الشرب اللي بغزة ملوثة وغيرها من المناطق اجبرنا انه تروح تخدم في العيادات في الخيام قتل وعدم ومنع السيارات الاسعاف انها تنقذ الشهداء وتنقذ الجرحى الكوادر الطبيه تتعرض ايضا الى الهجمات والامبولانسات الاعتقال من داخل الامبولانس تعطيل الامبولانسات عن الوصول الى الوقت المناسب الهجوم على المستشفيات هذول جيش دخلوا على المستشفيات للاعتقال شكرا Thank you, Shada. This was a very moving and, as you know, always a very gripping presentation of what is happening for so many years in uh, Palestine. But I think what we must also keep in mind as we think of the sufferings of the Palestine people, which Shada has brought together in such a gripping presentation, that this is not an old story, it's not history. And that there are more and more people, the Rohingyas and others, who are facing it. And I find it always, uh, you know, very unusual because I started my career as a health activist when 9 million refugees walked across from East Pakistan into India. And then the whole, uh, the liberation of Bangladesh and so on. So I think so we haven't learned from history and we seem to be producing more and more of that situation. So thank you, Shada. That was really very moving. Now we'll move on to the second presentation. Um, Shada has told you very, uh, uh, you know, about what is happening in one situation, but what Fran is now, uh, I'm going to introduce Fran, who doesn't really need an introduction, because she's uh, a well-known DHM activist, but she's Professor of Public Health, Australia Research Council Federation Fellow at Flinders University. She's been the founder director of the South Asian Institute of Health, the South Asian Australian Community of Research. More than anything, she's been one of the founder co-chairs of PHM, and she represented PHM in the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. Um, she's going to tell us about the larger context when you take all these sorts of situations all over the world, what are the larger contexts and how do we act on it? Because, as you know, we are an action movement. So we are not going to stop just at situation analysis, but what to do. So on to Fran. Great. Thanks, Ravi. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I come from Australia, from the land of the Ghana people, who are the traditional owners of the land where I live in Adelaide. Um, and I like to acknowledge the resilience of them through the processes of colonization. Um, they haven't lost their culture and they never ceded their land. So they're very proud people. And I'd also like to pay respects to Brack and the local indigenous people here and pay respects to their elders past and present. Um, well, and I just wanted to, we were meant to be meeting at GK and I just put these pictures in. Um, this was in 2000 when we planted trees on this barren, barren place. And you can see Hafdan Mala is here with some of the delegates. This is the Australians planting our tree. Every country planted a tree. When we got to GK, I think, Shereen, you will remember that the building was still being completed. So this is the bricklaying that's happened. When I came back this time, there is a tropical forest there. It was just amazing. So it was just so amazing. So I think that's a sign that things can change for the better. And when, when, when PHN and when people put their hearts into changing it. So, yeah, what I want to 
What I'm going to talk about is how unequal we are, who suffers seems to suffer most from that, and think about the way that all these crises we've heard about overlap. Um, and then I want to think about how this unequal economic system leads to what I'm going to call social and ecological murder, and, and think about that concept, and think about, well, could we govern for health instead of profit, and what would that look like? So, that, that's what I'll be talking about. And that's the main message. Put people before profits so we get health for all of them. Um, we've already seen some maps like this. So, here we have the uh, world wealth map, and there we have the life expectancy one. And you can see the obvious correlation. The dark bits there are where people live longer, the dark bits here are the rich bits. But that isn't kind of the only story, because it's not just about how rich you are, it's also about what do you do with the money. And here you can see that some countries, like South Africa, really don't do so well for, their, for the amount of money they have, whereas somewhere like Costa Rica does exceptionally well um, for the amount of wealth that they have. And you'll see that the US, considering it's one of the wealthiest countries, really doesn't have very good health status. So the good news, I guess, for all of us is that if you use your money, and if you distribute your wealth in a different way, then you can get much better health. So, important message. And then, in terms of child deaths, um, it's astounding that 16,000 children under five um, die every day in this world, when you think about that. And if they live in sub-Saharan Africa, they're 14 times more likely to do that than in the rest of the world. And if they come from a poor household, then they're twice as likely to die before they are five. <coughs> So, if you look at that, you can see in these countries that I have there, Mali, Burkina Faso, Cameroons, Indian, Brazil, Vietnam, there's nearly always a straight, not always quite a straight gradient, but the poor kids are dying before the rich <coughs> And I just wanted to show us we're in Bangladesh, that Bangladesh has had some good success in reducing <coughs> child mortality. And it's gone down from 133 in the 90s to 53 in 2011. So that's something of a success story. But there is surely a worldwide health crisis for indigenous people because of colonization, language, and land taken from indigenous people, genocide, not valuing their culture. And the same for. Um, the, the same for people who are displaced or refugees. And here I was thinking that there are many Palestinians in Lebanon, there are Rohingya people in Bangladesh, many Syrians in Europe, and my own government imprisons asylum seekers in the Pacific Islands of Papua New Guinea and Nauru. And, and, grant, and we have found over the five years that it's had totally devastating impacts on their health. There will be many reports showing how bad that is. Um, there have been deliberate policies around the world. Okay, okay. Uh, there have been deliberate policies around the world to wipe out indigenous cultures. In Australia, we have a stolen generation where children were taken away, pulled away from their mother's arms, and given to live either in institutions or in white families. And very often, they didn't can reconnect with their families, or when they did, they were much older. Similar stories in Canada, similar stories in the US, and I'm sure in so many other areas of the world. There's been you know, an attempted genocide of, of, of those indigenous cultures. And then, in terms of refugees and asylum seekers, instead of welcoming those people with open arms because of the situation they've been through, instead there's now political movements across the world to wipe up fear to say, these people are dangerous, we have to stop them. No, refugees are not welcome. Even though so many of the countries that are saying that have had their current success, certainly my country, built on the backs of, of migrants and refugees from earlier periods. 
Um, in my country, there were so many Vietnamese people who came during the Vietnam War, and they've been central to the success of Australia. So this is about whipping up fear. And, very, and so often what we do in health is look at the tip of the iceberg. We look at the kind of manifestations of where we get sick, and we don't go here and say, well, what's really, really happening? And a, a colleague um, from Switzerland was telling me yesterday that he'd seen a report from a, 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 one of these large JP Morgan banks saying it's not in our interest to make people well because if we make them well, we won't have an epidemic of chronic disease that we can treat because that's profitable. So this is where the money's made, this isn't where the money's made. So I think it's important that we really remember that point. And if we look at the world wealth compared to population, if you live in North America, you've got under 5% of the population, but you've got 36% of the wealth. If you live in Africa, you've got 16% of the population, and you've got less than 1% of the wealth. We shouldn't put up with that. It's not fair. It's what's driving the difference in health status. And let's think about who are the people who are this Well, apparently there are 2,208 billionaires in the world, and here's the top 10 of them. What do you notice about them? Oh. Wife, mainly, and men. Yay, they're all men, aren't they? Um, I did some calculations on the richest man in the world, whose net worth, every time I looked each month, his net worth was going up. But he now seems to be worth $150 billion himself. And I took a population of one of the poorest countries in the world, Malawi, and divided their wealth into his wealth, and he's got more or less the equivalent of 9 million Malawi people. I then did the same for Bangladesh. So all you Bangladeshis, he's got the same wealth as about just under 400,000 of you. Is that fair? Oh. Is it in any way, is it unbelievable? Yes. Okay. So, we have a really unequal world, I think. And of course, all that we heard about trade, the unfair trade, really relates to, that's one of the ways that this unfair concentration of wealth is maintained. And those inequities are growing, they're still going in the wrong direction. So these two bottom points, the three richest people in the US own the same wealth as the bottom half of the US population, which is about 160 million people. And the Oxfam's latest report on wealth makes the point that dangerous, poorly paid work for the many is supporting that extreme wealth for the few, that women are in the worst work around the world, and the super rich are all men, as well, nearly all men, as we have seen. So, and I just thought, uh, uh, how many of you are from India here? So, I'm sure you know what's happening in your country, but here's the top 10% um, in, in terms of income share, that's the middle 40%. And your Gini coefficient at 0.83, which measures Zero would be totally equal, a figure of 10 would be totally unequal, one person would have it. Your Gini coefficient is 0.83. I had a look at um, Bangladesh, and that says 34. So Bangladesh's Gini coefficient actually hasn't changed so much as other countries, which is interesting. Maybe part of why your, your, your health is doing quite well. Um, and I've compared you there with China, so you've got about the same Gini as China had in 1990, but in 2014 it was 53, so they've got worse, but then India at 0.8 something it is much worse. So I think these are some of the most important figures to think about the health of the population. And yet what this shows for high income countries Mental illness is higher in more unequal countries. So if you live in an unequal country, your mental health is bad. So is mental health getting worse in India? In, in the statistics? Yeah, it is. That's, 
very likely connected to this distribution of wealth. And while that seems a distant cause, it's a hidden cause, you know, it's below the surface if you think of the iceberg, it's still driving those inequities. And one of the ways in our world, the big thing that really drives this unequal wealth are corporations. They put profit before health and social concerns. They avoid paying tax as much as they can. They give their executives huge salaries. They have powerful lobbies to governments to encourage privatisation of water, gas, electricity, prisons. How many people have had that happening in their countries? That push for privatisation? Yeah, no lot. There's no evidence, or very little evidence, that these privatisations have resulted in price cuts. Generally, the opposite has happened, and they're not more efficient. And they require expensive regulation that governments pay for, and their environmental costs are externalised. So the local people very often bear the costs of their activities. They knock down forests, they dig big holes in the ground, and local communities are left to clear up when they've gone. And very often they've had huge effects on, on the local population. And because of this mad push for profit, ecological disaster is, is there. Um, I look back and found even Theodore Roosevelt saw this, you know, the American president of early in the 20th century. And he said, do not let selfish or greedy, selfish men or greedy interests skin your country of its beauty, its riches or its romance. And that's exactly what we're doing around the world. You know, we have actually skinned our countries of its ecological wealth. And Margaret Chan, who was the last Director General of WHO, said climate change is the defining health issue of the 21st century. A ruined planet cannot sustain human life in good health. So a really powerful message. And this is the, um, we have a champagne glass for who is consuming uh, CO2 emissions. So if you live in a country like me, you live in Australia, you're causing much more of the problem than people who say live in Malawi or in, in other countries. So the poorer people's income, the less they use. So that's very challenging, I think, to those of us who fly around the world to meetings like this, because we're using a lot of CO2. The other thing I think that's really supporting this, un this unequal situation around the world is the threat of fake news, of, of free, free speech. And George Orwell, you know, who wrote that book, 1984, where he talked about a world in which everything was controlled by by kind of a very fascist government, said the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those that speak it. So that goes back to those issues we talked about yesterday of speaking truth to power. And now we do have a big politics of fear. Lots of fake news, people ignoring evidence. I think yesterday the foreign minister of Brazil said that climate change is a hoax. A Marxist plot, yeah, even worse. A Marxist plot to redistribute income right now. And there are journalists being persecuted and murdered, journalists who are speaking out. And that, I think, is a really big health issue to protect free journalism. And there's a lot of culture wars. You know, there's now this white supremacist movement. So it seems to me, all these crises we're talking about, financial crisis, um, institutional malaise, where institutions keep restructuring, they keep ripping people off, like uh, we've had a banking rule commission in Australia and seen that banks have behaved very badly. It's leading to a big social crisis with lots of terrorism, fundamentalism, because people can see this unfair world. Um, the political leadership is, is really has declining trust. 
They're inciting a politics of fear, which leads to less trust. We've got the ecological climate crisis. That's leading to a terrible health crisis. And at the middle of it, we've got this unfair economic and political system, which is really focusing on profits above all else. And I think, you know, I think of the word social murder. So Engels, when he was looking at the early days of the Industrial Revolution, said the class which at present holds social and political control places hundreds of proletarians in such a position that they inevitably meet a too early and unnatural death. So it seems to me, when you think of that pattern of wealth, when you think of the way corporations work, social murder is happening across the world today. It's what's happening to all of us. And, you know, it does make you feel sick, that world, but this quote, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And I think we are living in a profoundly sick society at the moment. So what are we going to do? What do we do about it? Well, I'm just going to suggest four things to conclude, to say what are the sorts of measures we need to be taking about a fair economy, about how we measure how well we're doing, about employment and homes, and how we protect the environment from profit seekers. So even the beast itself, the heart of this neoliberal beast, is saying we need to be more equal. So Christine Lagarde, who's the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, has described inequality as corrosive to growth and society and considers it should be reduced. And another group from the IMF also said that there's evidence of economic damage from inequality and they should be more open to redistribution. So even from the heart of the capitalist system, there's concerns that things are getting too unequal. So it should be possible to govern for tax justice. Internationally, there needs to be ways of shutting down tax avoidance strategies and then using progressive tax to redistribute wealth. So instead of cutting taxes, they need to be much more progressive and increase the tax on high income earners and on people who hold wealth. And taxes need to be promoted as necessary for public goods and services vital to health. A group in my state had a great campaign saying without taxes, services disappear. And we need that kind of message. And people are willing to pay taxes if they think they're being used for the common good. So we need a big campaign that tax is good for health. It's an important part of a healthy society. Um, there was a great piece in the Guardian, British Guardian newspaper, which was headlined, We don't want billionaires' charities, we want them to pay their taxes. Which I think is really important. And imagine if the Gates Foundation money has instead just been given to the UN to support WHO. Wouldn't that have been better? would have been so much better than setting up private foundations that were then in the control of those billionaires. The other important thing is we need much more transparency, democracy and inclusivity. We need to recognise cultural diversity, whether that's of indigenous people, whether it's of new migrants to a country, and ensure that those people are able to participate in political processes, that all citizens can and particularly ensure that there is meaningful political participation for people who don't have much economic and social power. And most importantly, we need to limit lobbying by those corporations and other profit seekers. So we have transparent registers of who's talking to politicians, who's giving them donations. And, as I said before, we need a free press and strong independent <laughs> investigative journalism. Uh, in, in Australia, we only had a rule commission into our corrupt banking system because the public broadcaster did a fantastic program on, on what, what the banks were doing to people. I think if that program hadn't, hadn't come out, there wouldn't have been the, pre the political pressure to have it. So, you know, independent investigative journalism is absolutely vital. And when we measure things, we don't just want to measure how rich we are, but we want to measure, are we healthier? Uh, have we reduced economic inequities? 
Do we have a fair trading system? If those were the things governments were reporting on really, then I think we'd be a lot healthier now. In terms of employment, we need to create meaningful, secure work, and we need to have a livable income for those without work. On the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, we worked out it's, there's enough, more than enough money in the world for everyone to have a guaranteed income at, at times when, when they're not working in their lives, when they're children, when they're unemployed, and when they're disabled or older. It's not a question of resources, it's a question of what we do. And of course there needs to be gender equity in the workplace, and we need to value unpaid work. People who are looking after people in the home, people who are protecting environments and so on. And again, we have enough money for housing and healthy environments for all. It's just that we have to do that in a way that's about putting people's needs first and not putting the needs of people who want to make a profit first. Perhaps most importantly, we have to govern to take notice of the latest um, panel on climate change report which said we really need to limit global warming to one and a half degrees because that means we could achieve the SDGs or make it easier to achieve the SDGs for poverty, water, safe cities, food security and so on. And we have to govern for ecological health, tackling global warming, restoring natural environments, protecting biodiversity, Recognising biophilia, which is that people need connection with nature. It's good for our mental health. You know, I know when I go for a walk around the GK campus, it's fantastic to walk by those lakes and walk in the lovely forest. And I think the uh, many indigenous cultures are leading the way in understanding. I know colleagues, indigenous colleagues in Australia put so much work into caring for country. And I know in Latin America with the you out of the air movement, you're doing fantastic reconceptualization of what is the importance of nature in our lives. So in conclusion, we need to govern for health and well-being, not profit. We have to stop social murder. We have to redistribute wealth, tame corporations. We can easily provide healthy employment and housing for all. It's a question of will, not resources and we have to protect and value the natural environment. So, can you say the last lines for me, please? People before this, Thank you, Glenn. Uh, as usual, for this very uh, evidence-filled presentation, leading to action. As we move towards the, the sub-plenary, I would request the chairs of those plenaries to ensure no, we have, uh, one more speaker, I'm uh, just ensuring that move towards action because the first session is basically setting the context for the discussion during the day. I have great pleasure in uh, inviting Shiri, uh, a women's rights activist, from Bangladesh, who for years has been working on gender, human rights and development. She was the founder of the Nari Boko, a leading women's rights organization in Bangalore, and has worked in a voluntary capacity since 1983. The Nari Boko intervention is focused on women's um, self health and she has done many things that I will not go into details, but more important that she's been an active member and inspiration for the People's Health Movement and always part of a wonderful hosting scheme whenever all of us have been coming here, but reminding us of women's empowerment, gender <coughs> and the human rights issues. Thank you. Good morning everyone. I think we are sitting into the tea break, are we? No, no. No, no. Okay, okay. Oh, I see. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, good. I won't need that much of it. So, I would like to actually begin by expressing my deep gratitude. And I know I speak here on behalf of every Bangladeshi in this room. Our gratitude to Grant. 
for having um, rescued, in a sense, it's a sense, rescued the Theatre for from a moment when it seemed like everything was falling apart. And the people who worked day and night to make sure it happened again, I really want to thank them as well. So given the turbulence of the past few days, I do not have a PowerPoint, which may be a relief to some of you. <laughs> so as we assemble here today, what I want to start with are the million people who are living in unimaginable conditions in refugee camps in the southeast part of Bangladesh. <coughs> the Rohingyas were forced to flee their homes, their villages, and their country and seek shelter in Bangladesh. Bangladesh now hosts, and I want to just speak to my Palestinian comrades who have suffered for 70 years of refugee life. Um, Bangladesh now hosts what is called the largest refugee camp in the world, Kutubalong. Kutubalong is now a name that seems everybody knows. The Rohingyas arrived in Bangladesh, has been arriving for many years, but a major influx actually happened in 1978. And most of these uh, Rohingyas were then repatriated through negotiations, which involved the organization of Islamic countries, and they were able to negotiate an almost not 100 percent, but an almost full repatriation. And, um, and but again this erupted in 1991, when a larger number of people came into Bangladesh, and this time the negotiations were not as successful, and many remained behind. The, the Myanmar government, from where they were fleeing, insisted on verification of each person that they were willing to take back and they refused to accept of more than 225,000 who were left behind because they did not accept that they were from Myanmar and the official policy of the Myanmar government has been to call these people Bangladeshi that they were migrants from Bangladesh uh, as many of you know under British India Many of you know other British India, um, there was no borders as such and people did actually move but people moved back and forth. So there were people who, we have a large Rakhine community in Bangladesh and Rakhine state in Myanmar had a large community of Rohingyas. Um, the other uh, error often made in, in the international media is they are referred to as Rohingya Muslims. Actually, there's a huge camp down in Koxi Bazaar, which are Rohingya Hindus. And who just celebrated, by the way, Durga Puja, which is the biggest puja for Bengalis. For the first time in many, many years, they were able to celebrate in a refugee camp. Um, so these people arrived Bangladesh <coughs> in shock and many with both <coughs> Majority were women and children, and the women had suffered multiple pain. Every woman I spoke to in September 2017, soon after the major exodus or influx of this end, uh, every woman I spoke to spoke of multiple pain. Not once, at least twice, not maybe four times, five times. And these were carried out by members of the Myanmar army, but not only. This is also important. It is not only the Myanmar. There has been a campaign of hatred that has been building up for a long time and so unfortunate that this campaign is led by the Buddhist world. So these people have already suffered years of discrimination and deprivation and finally the arbitrary stripping of their citizenship. So these are stateless people in a sense and they were deprived of basic services in their own country. 
They did not receive health services. They did not receive family planning services. I met women as young as 25 with already five children and women. And uh, they were deprived of basic schooling. So the only schooling these communities provided were the ones based in their mosques. So mosque-based schooling, which was religious schooling. So these people arrived in Bangladesh at a time when Bangladesh was making major advances in social indicators. Um, in fact, the best progress in South Asia, Bangladesh was making in terms of education, primary education for sure, education for girls, removing uh, the, uh, the disparity between boys and girls in, in primary education has been completely eliminated. In terms of health, Bangladesh has made very important uh, advances in uh, reducing infant mortality and um, not so uh, impressive advances in reducing maternal mortality, but still there has been reduction in maternal mortality as well. And so when these people arrived in this condition, there was immediately also a sense of fear that what is this going to do to our uh, achievements? Because Bangladesh is not a rich country, although it has made tremendous progress, it is um, now being termed as nearly, uh, what is the word of this thing? Middle income country. Middle income. Middle income. Middle income. Yes, nearly middle income. Nearly. So, uh, whether we would actually uh, lose on our own achievements by shelter, giving shelter to nearly a million workers. <coughs> and when, at a time when the international community is in fatigue from Syria, from uh, yet, well, now Yemen, but before that Congo, before, I mean, we can go on, the list is gone, the world is dry, um, is uh, conflict is uh, devouring many, many parts of the world. So at the time when it, the international um, effort or international resources are also short. So this has been a tight road that the Bangladesh government has been walking in between offering the shelter, trying to feed them and trying to provide health care. And in this whole effort, many Bangladeshi NGOs, including BRAC and Kamashastu Kendu, have been working there, along with many other Bangladeshi NGOs, to try and provide basic services to refugees, as has been international NGOs and of course the UN agencies are there. But still, uh, by all uh, measure, or by all measures, it is inadequate, it is insufficient, and every month we hear that uh, we are falling short of the annual uh, projection of what is needed. So where these resources will come from, we don't know. My government also does not know where it might come from. What has complicated the situation, of course, is that China, Russia and India have chosen to support the Myanmar government through all these atrocities and this, what one can call a genocidal uh, attack on the Rohingyas. Bangladesh has actually found itself almost isolated in trying to uh, garner international support for its, for its efforts. Um, the ex of course the UN has stood by, but the UN relies on others to provide the resources. Um, so, the, these people, as I said, were already in a compromised state of health and education. So the, the journey itself has also not been very easy, obviously. They have, some of them have traveled 10 days walking through very rough terrain. And then having to make a river crossing, some even chose to come the sea route, and we had a number of tragic uh, mishaps where boats have capsized, and the large uh, lead toll has been children when these boats have capsized. Um, the <coughs> many also arrived with bullet injuries, and there have been, uh, I don't know the numbers, um, not that many amputations will have to take place. Um, and as I, said, as I said, many of the women arrived with uh, injuries resulting from rape and sexual assault. 
last week during IPHU, we had a gynecologist, a woman, a doctor from UK, working in the camps who came to speak to the participants of the IPHU, and she could not even speak during the session. She was herself so traumatized. But during the tea break, she said that she had not seen um, such vaginal injuries in her entire uh, work life. Although I mean, she was young, she didn't have a very long work life, but she could not even describe the kind of uh, vaginal tears and lacerations that uh, she had found in examining many of the women. Um, of course, besides the physical exhaustion and psychological trauma, many of the women were also pregnant. Now, many were actually in late pregnancy. As I said, there are no family planning services in that time for the regular community. So there was very high um, women were, uh, as I said, I met women who were 25 and 27 who already had uh, four or five children. Child marriage was very common. Polygamy was very common. All the things of this one which had actually made major progress in you know, almost, uh, not eliminating, but almost eliminating polygamy. Child marriage we are still not doing very well on, but uh, better, than, better than Myanmar and the many girls. So many of the women who were pregnant needed special care. So the entire situation posed a huge challenge to the NGOs who were trying to provide health services. It was not easy. Uh, not only because of the numbers, but because of the multiple kinds of uh, problems that uh, the refugees uh, were having, were exhibiting or were reporting. Um, this, of course, uh, the situation, I went down in the first week of September, and then uh, again in, in February. Um, and I've been involved in um, many, many organizations are of course involved in providing services. My own organization has been much more involved in another track which was trying to seek justice for the situation. And we have been involved in petitioning the International Criminal Court on, uh, on granting jurisdiction for an investigation because Myanmar is not a state party to the ICC, but Bangladesh is. So this was a, a, a very complicated one, and we were not the only ones. There were six other petitions from uh, international agencies, international groups rather than lawyers. Um, but it was important that the Bangladesh Civil Society also was part of this effort, and that was something my organization coordinated. And one of the things we found um, in trying to prepare the petition was that although so much was being reported and so much I myself heard, it was not considered evidence. It was considered hearsay. And these were some of the challenges of the activists we rush into a situation unprepared for what needs to be documented, how, and what kind of confidentiality protocols have to be observed. And etc. 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 So there were lots of very well-meaning people, including the media, who had been documenting, but apparently some of this documentation has actually had it um, opposite, yeah. Because um, uh, because when, in a sense um, these, these actually stand up in a as evidence in a in a court of law. And the requirements of that is actually different than the requirements of journalists. Although what, what the media did, both the Bangladeshi media and the international media, was extremely crucial in bringing to attention the sufferings of this community, which has been largely an invisibilized minority in the world. So this was another challenge we faced. And um, it took me back in a sense, when I spoke to, I spoke, we spoke to, we organized the visit of three Nobel laureate women to the Rohingya camps as a way of amplifying the voices of Rohingya women to the world. And in that process, I found that the Rohingya women um, were able to talk about the, the sexual assault, the rape that they had suffered in a much more easy, no, I shouldn't say it was easy. Wrong, so, <laughs> wrong word. But 
It was not, they were not silenced. I, I suppose that's what I want to say. They were not silenced. It reminded me, reminded me of 47 years ago, 1971, when 10 million people from East Pakistan took shelter in um, the neighboring states of India, West Bengal, and Tripura primarily, but other states. And our chairperson Ravi was a young volunteer at that time in the refugee camps. Um, the Pakistan army had undertaken a genocidal attack, leading to the massive exodus of 10 million. And unofficial estimates suggest that nearly 500,000 people died in those camps. Um, despite the best efforts of the government of India and Oxfam and many other organizations, and of course the international community, it was, I think, the first major moment of internationalism since the Spanish Civil War, where the world's people stood by Bangladesh, even if the world's governments did not. Many governments did not. So, although emergency medical care has come a long way since 1971, and today we have not, um, the, in the Rohingya camps, we have not seen those kinds of uh, numbers of deaths. And um, so, obviously, emergency medical care has improved by leaps and bounds, um, but continues to be a challenge. And um, as to in 1971, the other figure, that haunts all of us is the 200,000 women estimated who were raped by the Pakistan army and its collaborators. Although after uh, 16th of December 1971, our independence, the women who had suffered rape and sexual assault were given the title Viranguna. Viranguna is the big only word which means warrior woman. And this title was given so that they would not be belittled, so that they would not be dishonored. But the opposite happened. They were stigmatized, they were dishonored, they were forced into um, third trimester abortions. Many who had given birth um, subsequently were forced to give up their babies because the babies were considered enemies. Um, so, the Pirahamas were often very little, which was positive. And when my organization, Nari Pokho, took up an initiative, and we called it Ekaturete Nari Pulitsi, the Forgotten Women of 71, because these women had been exiled into silence. And among the women who did speak up were the poorest. Among the middle class or upper class women who had suffered rape, they were able to actually take some to call new identities and emigrate, and some were able to somehow uh, remove that uh, what was considered shame and dishonor from their identity. But the poor women, mostly um, rural women, were about many were abandoned by their families. I have only two minutes. I'm sorry. Many were abandoned by their families. And many more were um, uh, pushed to the edges of villages. So they were typically living in little huts or embankments on, on the side of the river, etc. And uh, um, so I have, let me just skip through some things. Um, so they were ill treated, and I were forcing about their babies, etc. In 200, 2011, which is the 40th year of our independence, when Nari Puka took up this initiative, many of the women remarked and said, the Pakistanis raped me once, but what have you done for 40 years? And this is what I went, this is the consciousness I went to the Rohingya camps to, that this must not happen again. And I was glad to see, well, glad is also that one, <laughs> that the women talked, the Rohingya women talked about the Dulu, they call it Dulu. Rape. Much more easily, they were not going to be silenced, and many of the grandmothers said, These babies are ours. And so I think somewhere things have, despite the horrific background of all this, there has been some improvement, there has been some change. Um, 
So this notion of loss of honor and chastity, shankramani, ijjothani, is what is referred to, to rape and sexual violence, of course it pervades rapes even today. So we have not been able to challenge these notions or counter them even in 40 years. So even today, women who suffer rape, suffer sexual assault, choose opt to be silent, opt for silence rather than speak up, rather than report to the police, except in conditions where the physical injuries are so bad that they require medical care. So the rapes that are reported are usually the ones where the injuries are bad. And in this case, again, I must mention that the government of Bangladesh, and this was the result of advocacy by Nari Bokko, set up in the year 2000 something called the Multi-Sectoral Program for Violence Against Women. And this set up one-stop crisis centers in public hospitals, and this has expanded all over the country, hoping it will make it easier for women to report, and reporting to a hospital where the police will come, they don't have to go to a police station, they don't have to go and run around, the forensic examination will take place in the same place, and the treatment will also be offered in the same place, as well as the legal advice will be given in the same place. So this is something, um, again, another improvement. I wanted to speak about one more thing. Do I have two minutes? Yes. Um, in 1993-94, Nani Poko took up another initiative under the leadership of Nasreen Haq, which was to do a survey in five districts of women's health seeking behavior. And the key finding there was that women did not want to go to institutional, seek institutional care or advice or help because of how they were treated by health professionals. And this is something um, that when Nasreen spoke about publicly, she was attacked by the medical association as um, he's exaggerating. Etc. But it was actually we have the we have the survey results from the industry of especially how poor women are treated. This led her to initiate a project on accountability of health service providers, which was one of the basic uh, elements of that was to activate oversight committees, which were which included public representatives to sit every month and review the complaints that people were making. And the point that Nari Poko was making is that changing the behavior of health professionals is not going to take additional resources. It will just take a change of heart and mind. And with that, I just want to end by saying the challenges remain. The challenges of countering and uh, contesting the norms and values that restrict women's access to healthcare, whether it is today or in, in refugee camps or not in refugee camps, especially in the case of uh, rape and sexual assault, and the uh, attitude and prejudice of health service providers continue, though I think the younger doctors are less prejudiced and less um, bigoted, but that remains, and above all, the <coughs> question of accountability to people, and especially to poor women, continue to be a challenge today. And so I leave it to the people's health movement, what are we going to do about it? After these very moving and gripping presentations from Palestine, from Bangladesh, the Rohingya and the Rohingya camp, and the global view from I know many of you I can see as I have been watching from this end are beginning to feel low and low spirited. But I want to leave you with an important message because we cannot afford to feel low. And I just want to remind you of an idea that came to a group of us in a meeting in Cairo when we coined a new word, social vaccine. That we are the social vaccine. And at that time I remember Five of us, uh, David, Ryan, myself, and we have written, uh, even if you Google the word social vaccine, you'll be happy to find that it comes to PHM and this idea. But I want you to leave this room as you go for tea, thinking about the fact that from the 1940s that we start, and even much more as uh, from the thing that uh, Ryan said, things have not changed. 
So I want you to all to remember and go back and also when you have time, open the section on war, violence, conflict and natural disaster. When we said this in Sabha 18 years ago, it seemed prophetic. Now it's no longer prophecy. It's happening all around us. And as you leave, and as we continue to uh, uh, discuss these issues after tea, please remember, People's Health Movement and all of you who are part of it, you are the social vaccine. You are the people who are going to act on the social determinants. And it is, that is the message that you have to carry back, that when we work together, because in all these presentations there were also things that we could do, and I hope that the sub plenaries will take this forward. So my request to all the chairs of the sub plenaries, make sure that the last 15 minutes at least, all of you say, what can we do, each of us, at whatever level, with the problem? Because I think we have to become the social vaccine that prevents these social determinants at all levels from continuing to act and we have to immunize not only ourselves, but our communities and our people to be able to be empowered to tackle them. So thank you all.